Welcome everyone. Welcome back from uh, our break. It's very nice to be back here. I'll let you in on a secret. I'm not here as a teacher. I'm barely instructor. Um, I'm here to actually learn the Dharma. And my teacher, Tsongsekens Rinpoche, he's very cleverly devised that the best way to, for people to learn is to teach. So, um, so I'm really just here as, and you're here as part of my learning process. So for that, for that, I thank you. Thank you very much for showing up here. And I think it's highly questionable whether whether I can really offer you much. Um, I justify this by the fact that this will, this will facilitate uh, a period where we're gonna sit and study the Dharma. So that's good. It's good for me, it's good for you. And um, certainly the, the book that we're studying is, is worth gold. And um, this study is certainly something that it's wonderful that we're undertaking. So in that sense, this is a great thing. So I'm very happy to be back. Um, and um, I'm very happy that you're there. And for all the above reasons, then um, this is a wonderful occasion. I guess us doing this study here is something that really holds the key to what ails the world. Uh, of course, if we if we uh, listen to the to the media, and we sort of generally hang out with with uh, the people who subscribe to the belief systems of the modern world, then the troubles of the world lie out there. It's all those other people, the crazy politicians, the responsible people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we can sit around for ages regurgitating that. But you know, even if we were to let's say have all the politicians do the right thing, the, the, the cause for suffering still remains, the cause for confused action still remains. Even if they might behave nicely for a while, um, and even if everything came true in terms of what we want, this wouldn't be the solution at all, because we're still stuck with this single problem that drives suffering universally, and it is the basic fundamental delusion. And that is what the Buddha was remedying um, upon discovering freedom from this, upon attaining enlightenment. The Buddha discovered something and he could see that everybody possesses this. So in that sense, what we're doing here has so much value for the world at large. So we should rejoice and feel incredibly joyous about having this moment of pursuing the Dharma and having this opportunity of practicing the path. And so we should never be fooled by the sort of the discourse that leads us to believe that there's the trouble lies outside in the politicians, it lies outside in this and that. We should really, if we really care about the world, we should really get down to where it actually originates, which is this place where our delusion takes place. It doesn't mean we're bad people. I'm just a bit confused, and this can be this can be addressed. This is what we're doing with the path. We're we're onto it, but um, it's definitely something where application is needed, and that's where we we're very fortunate that we have teachers, that we have teachings, and we have clear parameters for a path. So something can be done, and um, yeah, we should do it. So with that kind of motivation, really. Um, we come to this study, and uh, let's see. Let's see what Trungpa has to say. We'll, um, so this study is divided into two components, really. First, it has to do with the, the um, you can say what really actually is the skillful means, which is the, the devotion that cries out to the teachers, and which is essentially founded on the practice, the practice of the path. And so that's where, uh, while we're gonna study 
the theory of the path, then very much um, the first component here, the calling out to the gurus, crying to the gurus, is very much practice. So that's where there's a whole different flavor really in this in this initial section. And I think I've mentioned a few times, practitioners um, very often would chant this first thing in the morning, calling out to the teachers of the uh, various lineages. And by the way, on your left, you have Jamian Kinza Wangpo, surrounded by all these teachers. And then invoking all the teachers, then really bringing mind back to sanity and recognizing the, um, the truth of our present situation and its incredible advantages, and then what needs to be done. So in this context, we've, we've, um, we've looked at, or rather we've gone through the lineage as such, and now really you could say having invoked the lineage, now we, we then gather our mind and focus on what it is that the lineage wishes to, you could say, share with us. And we invoke the compassion of the lineage for us to realize the, the you could say, the message of the lineage. And so we've, we've uh, focused on the, the rarity of being born a human, which is winning in the lottery, being born in this particular life, regardless of the circumstances, we are extraordinarily fortunate. And then having been born as a human is, is wonderful, but, and this is where we then reach to, then this is where Jamgun Kontrol, he writes, there is no one on earth who will not die. Even now, one after another, they pass away. I also will die very soon. And yet, like an idiot, I prepare to live for a long time. Guru, think of me. Look upon me quickly with compassion. Grant your blessings so that I curtail my worthless schemes. So this is a reflection that famously is regarded as possibly the biggest reflection we have in the entire Buddhist teaching. It's the reflection that leaves the biggest imprint on our mind. And it is the fact that we, we will die and we're also surrounded by others who will die and others who have died. And so our present situation here is in no way, you could say something that we should rely on or even be particularly concerned about. Of course, we should be practical and do what we need to do, but we're not gonna be here for very long. There's nobody who hasn't passed away. When we say like an idiot, I prepare to live for a long time, I can identify with that. I actually am rather worried about my jaded nature and the degree to which I fail to take into account that, that I'm not here for a very long time. I struggle with making peace with the fact that I'm getting older and that I will die. And it's as if it's something that is sitting there as sort of an unwanted, sort of um, unpleasant phenomenon as if it's something that shouldn't take place. And it's a reality. It's just the nature of things. Sentient beings, they struggle against reality. And all the Buddha wishes to do is just for us to awaken to reality. And the thing is, awakening to reality is also awakening to that which lies beyond what we call the dharmas of birth and death, the dharmas that are marked with birth and death. We hold on to that which which doesn't have any reality. And that's why we're holding on to permanence in a world that by nature is impermanent, by nature is not something that can be grasped. And so that's where we are rather innocent. But the thing is, we might have heard the teachings on impermanence and that's where we're a bit more than just innocent. We're rather dim. Now in the Buddhist teaching, we can, we can, um, we can afford to be uh, talk to ourselves quite loudly in the sense of calling, calling ourselves names like idiot because we recognize basic goodness. And so calling ourselves an idiot is not something to do with lacking compassion for ourselves and so on. It's rather our, our confused actions, they lack compassion. And so being compassionate is actually recognizing what it is that's real and what it is that's deception. And so 
following after the the sort of the voice of our inner deception um, is something that we really should cut through. And that's where we can be quite strong in terms of calling a spade a spade and referring to the, the part of ourselves which refuses to acknowledge reality. We can call that the part of our, us that is an idiot. And also there's nothing inherently existing in that idiot. It really just requires that we look and we begin to not make choices based on this, you could say, uninformed and deceptive, um, these deceptive impulses that ultimately are founded on, on ignorance, simply ignoring reality. So that's where luckily we have a connection to sanity. And again, this is where we're privileged. There's not many people who have this connection to sanity. So that's where we invoke the teacher. The teacher is there for us at all times. It's a matter of whether we're open to the teacher or not. And it's in the co context of our openness then that this intelligence can seep through. And this moment of intelligence seeping through is what we call blessings. This is where something penetrates our dimness. And it's on the basis of that then that we supplicate the teacher that this may lead us to not be caught up in really what doesn't have any value whatsoever. So this is this is the component of practice. And this is the component of us recognizing the value of the wisdom of the, the path, the presence of sanity embodied in the teacher and invoking the teacher that we may pursue then the path of liberation. So, um, so we'll we'll then proceed to the um, to the teaching itself. Now, this book is called Journey Without Goal, and um, that's a pretty cool title. But of course, we'd want to be a little bit more than just you'd say um, to say, wow, that's a, that's a cool title. We want to know exactly what it is that we mean with journey without goal. Well, there is a journey because we're still, you could say, <clears throat> we're still um, we're still caught up with our confusion. At the same time, as much as we're caught up with our confusion, it's not as if um, this confusion really defines us. And in some way, the Vajrayana operates with the notion that we are we are innately Buddhas and um, as such where we are this process that we are undertaking that we call a path it's not going anywhere it's not taking us somewhere it's taking us to where we are the thing is we're not where we are we are all sorts of other places so you could say we're situated within reality by nature, and yet we're caught up in irreality. Now, on the basis of the practice of the path and the inspiration of the teacher, we might begin to make contact with reality. On the basis of the inspiration of the teacher, there's, there's a clear vision of what enlightenment looks like, how enlightenment talks and walks, and following the example and the inspiration of the teacher, we do this not as, as sycophant, sycophants or followers, or um, you could say persons looking for uh, some great parental figure, but rather as students, students who would like to emulate an apprentice with the teacher. So, we, so we're essentially asking the teacher what needs to be done. And on the basis of having asked, the teacher then giving us some indications, we then practice the path. And it's on the basis of practicing the path that we discover sanity. And it's on the basis of discovering sanity that we begin to have some inkling of this innate, you could say primordial, um, this primordial freedom that we possess. So as we progress along the path, it's continually relating back to that. <clears throat> this is what we could call basic goodness. And it's in this sense that the, the, uh, the journey is about us taking hold of what we already are. 
and this is where we give the image of, particularly then in the context of the Vajrayana, the teacher is, is someone who essentially enthrones us as being rulers. We were born as royalty and the teacher enthrones us to be the royalty that, that we, that we uh, you could say, are, um, we are by birth. And of course, some of us might sort of have a problem with that image, but probably we know what it means. It means that we're not destined to be miserable persons, even though we might like to sort of make a drama out of our misery. Um, and we can, of course, entertain ourselves with that drama to some extent. But at the same time, we could also see that is a tremendous waste of time. And that has very little to do with our actual nature. And as we begin to have some experience of actually beginning to relate to reality, we can see we're more than just the, the drama of our ego, the drama of our uh, clashes and the impulses of our clashes and so forth. There's an underlying sanity. And so the teacher very much relates to that. We might want to just be a follower. We might like to be saved by somebody who's going to save the day for us. But the teacher, and right from the time of the Buddha, has made it very clear that the, the teacher's role is not to save us. The teacher's role is to show us how we ourselves could do this. But the potential is, is there. And that's why in the, you could say the entire Buddhist teaching is essentially Vajrayana, because right from the start, the entire premise of the Buddhist teaching is that we possess this basic goodness. And so the Vajrayana simply, rather than focusing on our confusion, focuses on our innate abiding sanity. And this is where we then, on the basis of us being open to the teacher and having some inspiration from the teacher on the basis of a deep sense of respect and appreciation for the teacher and a joy to encounter the teacher's um, and you could say uh, the teacher's enlightenment, recognizing the qualities of the teacher, then we, we begin to mingle our mind with the teachers. And it's at this point then that the teacher could give us Abhisheka in the sense of enthroning us to be what we truly are. So that's where, just like the, the queen, she was, she was uh, enthroned, given the scepter and orb, then on the basis of our innate disposition, our innate uh, heritage, or what we sometimes refer to as Buddha nature or lineage, we then receive Abhisheka. So here, Trungpa Rinpoche, he's, he's going through the, um, the, um, the various aspects of the, of the Abhisheka. And so we're gonna talk about essentially four Abhishekas, but we're gonna emphasize the first one. The first Abhisheka is really the Abhisheka where we're told what's what, and we're told what's what in terms of our conceptual mind. So the first Abhisheka very much works with the con bringing onto the path, the conceptual understanding of reality. This is what we call the development stage practice. And it's there that we're informed we, we're informed how what we normally think of as our person is much more than that. This necessarily is not particularly um, in the interest of ego. Ego would rather stay with a sort of a, a, the drama of our suffering. But here, this is beyond suffering. This is the us being informed and installed to actually take hold of this nature, which is greater than that. And that's where with the development stage practice, we continually come back to recognizing the purity that we innate, innately possess. And particularly the first Abhisheka very much does so engaging the conceptual mind with the visualization practice, the mantra recitation and so forth. And essentially enabling us to connect with the form of yoga that connects us with this purity. So, um, we first receive then the Abhisheka, um, the first Abhisheka, and this has five aspects. This is what we call, Trumpramitra refers to as, as the Abhishekas uh, of the five Abhishekas of form. And we also sometimes refer to those of you who studied the pure appearance, this is what we refer to as the external 
um, beneficial empowerments. So this is where you could say we we actually get installed and receive all of the paraphernalia uh, of the um, of our role as a Buddha. And then the following ones, they're a bit more profound. And Trumpa doesn't go that much into these. And this really also the inner, the three inner uh, Abhishekas, they have, uh, they require more, they require actually a foundation of first having a proper basis in the, in the first Abhisheka form. So we're going to look at Trumpa explaining this then. He says, this presentation of the first Abhisheka is based on it's based on the tradition of Anuttara, Anuttara Yoga, which is the pinnacle of the three lower tantric yanas. So we have what's called the four classes of Tantra, which is Kriya Tantra, Kriya Yoga Tantra, Upa Yoga Tantra, and then Yoga Tantra. And then we have Anuttara, An Anuttara Yoga Tantra. And Anuttara Yoga, means the highest, Lamegu in Tibetan. And it means that this is the highest of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the tantric jhanas, so to speak. So there's different ways of classifying the tantric vehicles. Sometimes we talk about four classes of tantra, sometimes six. We would talk about the three outer tantras, and then we would talk about the Anuttara Yoga Tantra as the fourth, or we would divide Anu Yoga Anuttara Yoga Tantra into three, in which case then we talk about Maha, Anu, and Ati, which is more the way that's done in the ancient traditions and the, the newer tradition, the newer translations, they tend to talk about four classes of Tantra. But that's really secondary. So anyway, here we are talking from the point of view of the Anuttara, uh, the Anuttara Yoga Tantra, which is what basically is what's taught most widely. So here then, um, this being the highest yoga tantra, Trungpa Rinpoche says, according to the tradition of Anuttara Yoga, um, the first Abhisheka of form is the Abhisheka of the jar or vase. Actually, the, this Abhisheka is symbolic of bathing. According to the custom in medieval India, when a person wanted to bathe himself, he or she would go out into a river with a jar, scoop up a jar full of water, and pour it over himself. So the Jaya Abhisheka is a process of purifying. Some of you have been to India, you, you'll see this is how you, if you go to the Ganges or other rivers in India, this is how people would simply wash. They'd go out there and they would have a jar with them and pour it over themselves. So Trumpa continues, we're cleaning out the hidden corners of the body, seeing that our ears are clean and our armpits are clean. Any hidden corners in our basic makeup have to be cleansed. In this case, the purification is obviously psychological. Psychologically, we have smelly armpits that generate lots of odor for our neighbors and for ourselves. We begin to dislike that psychological odor, odor, odor and our neighbors might begin to dislike it as well. <laughs> In fact, we feel completely revolted, which is a very positive step at this point because we actually have to, because we actually have the means to clean up properly. So us recognizing our insanity is a sign of our sanity. And us recognizing that we're a bit of a mess, um, that's a sign of sanity. It's more of a problem if we are a mess and we think we're not. So that's where our realization that something needs to be done is, is extremely fortunate. And then also that, that we also have the means that is, is extraordinarily fortunate. Trumpa continues, you may remember that the word Abhisheka literally means anointment. Through the vase Abhisheka, we are cleaned out completely. It is similar to the Christian tradition of baptism or christening, which also makes use of water as a symbol of psychologically cleansing oneself. The vase Abhisheka is also like washing our hands before we eat. If we go to the bathroom just before we have lunch, we won't wash our hands. That is a basic and sensible law of human conduct. We should taste our food rather than our excrement when we eat. The Vasa Abhisheka is the same kind of sensible approach. It is connected with the Vajra family. Water is a symbol of the sharpness and the clarity of Vajra, which cleanses us of any psychological dirt. Then we are cleaned out 
and fundamentally purified. We can put on our clean clothes. So again, this means that with the Vasa Abhisheka, we begin to relate to the part of ourselves that is not caught up in our habitual patterns, in our karma and kleshas. And that's where it's on the basis of that then that the journey can begin. So that's also why the further sort of preparation of the nundro is essential really so that we can emerge as somebody who really is clean, has, you could say, cleaned up our act. We've come clean. We're actually what we want to do. We're not struggling with all sorts of impulses that seem to drive us in places that we don't want. We're actually what we really want to do. And that's essential. Before we do that, we can't really start Vajrayana yoga. There's not really anywhere to um, to go if we're still sort of, um, you could say the classical image, if we have a a very precious substance, it's no good to pour it into a dirty container. So for us to actually engage in, you could say the subtle Vajrayana practices, there has to first be this sense of us being properly clean. We are celebrating then being clean by putting on our clean clothes. We don't put on clean clothes if we're still dirty. So the clean clothes is really what you could say highlights our clean condition. So this is where we are anointed in this sense of becoming um, empowered as a Buddha. And it starts off with this Vajra quality of clarity, sharpness. In an Abhisheka, the students are regarded as princesses and princes who are coming to court. They're just about to sit on the throne and relate with their subjects, that is, with their subjective gossip, their mind, their samsaric world. So here there's no hierarchy taking place in terms of us as princesses and princesses being superior to others. We're their servants, essentially. When we are entering the Vajrayana, we enter Vajrayana as a servant to humanity, to all sentient beings. But we are relating with the world. And the first thing we do is relate to the, you could say, the entourage of our subconscious gossip, the display that is continually percolating in our mind. So that's where, where we rule and that's where we rule without, without being blind to what's, what's happening in our realm, what's, what's happening within our world. Our world is populated with neurotic impulses. And this is where we then begin to have some, some role in terms of ruling. So that's where we begin to take our seat and begin to have some authority. So this is where the teacher wants us to be clear that we have that authority. And the teacher gives us this uh, enthronement or this Abhisheka for us to begin to take our role and our seat as royalty. So Trungpa Rinpoche continues, so the idea of Abhisheka is receiving royal treatment. The Tibetan word for Abhisheka is Wang, which simply means empowerment. The student is empowered as the royal ruler, the majestic one. Before he or she gives an audience to the public, a king first, first bathes and puts on his clothes. Then he puts on his crown. That is the second Abhisheka. So now we're going to talk about the five Abhishekas that, that are part of the first Abhisheka. The, what we call the Vas Abhisheka now has five parts. So this is what Trumper is going to be describing. So, so still within what we call the the outer, the outer, um, the outer beneficial empowerment, which is the Vas uh, Vas empowerment. There are, there's sort of a little bit of a, the five, five aspects of this. So, so, um, so here, when we talk about first, second, third, and fourth, this is among, these are the five of this first empowerment. So before he gives audience to the public, a king first bathes and puts on his clothes. Then he puts on his crown. That is the second Abhishekha or crown or coronation Abhishekha. So we've been washed, we're putting on the crown. Trungpa Rinpoche says, in this Abhishekha, the student is presented with a crown which has five prongs and is inlaid with jewels. 
Each prong represents a different Buddha family, Bhaja, Ratna, Padma, Karma, and Buddha. So you would have seen, you would see this in, in the deities that they, that they wear these crowns. And when you receive the empowerment, sometimes it would be very elaborate with an actual sort of passing around a crown, but very often it would just be a card. The, the Vajra master will just hold up a card where we see then uh, one of these crowns. Anyway, regardless, um, um, receiving this, Tumbarimbu says, finally we're coronated. We're made into a tantric master, or at least a confident practitioner, a confident person. The crown Abhisheka is connected with the Ratna family. There is a sense of being enriched and a sense of pl plentifulness, lack of threat, openness and generosity. So we have the Vaza Abhisheka of the, of, of rather the washing of the, the Vajra family. Now we have the crown of the Ratna family. Then Trumbunamri continues, at this point in the Abhisheka, we are like a young king who is very ambitious and youthful, but still does not know how to handle his subjects. Although we have been coronated, our hands are just resting in our lap and we have nothing to hold on to. In that condition, we could feel quite self-conscious. There is a big crown sitting on our head and we're dressed up in robes, but our hands are just loose. We could pick our nose or scratch our chin, but we still feel awkward. At this point, we're presented with the third Abhisheka, the Abhisheka of the Vajra. The idea is to give a royal toy to this little prince or princess. The first toy we receive, which should be given to us in the right hand, is the Vajra Septa, or in Tibetan Doje, which we discussed earlier as the symbol, is the symbol, as the symbol of indestructibility. It represents immense power. Seven qualities characterize the Vajra. It cannot be cut, it cannot be disintegrated, it cannot be obstructed, it is penetrating, it is fearless, it is open, and it is utterly destructive. According to the tradition, the Vajra is a weapon as well as a scepter. Each time the king throws the Vajra, it goes out, it fulfills its deadly purpose, and it comes back into his hand. The Abhisheka of the Vajra is related to the Padma family. Padma here is the sense of being a beautiful lover. In this Abhisheka, you acknowledge it, you acknowledge as a powerful person, and at the same time, you're told that you can make love without destroying somebody else. Rather, you could create by making love. So holding the Vajra brings a feeling of compassion, warmth, and hospitality. In the next Abhisheka, the Abhisheka of the Bell, not only does the student have a scepter in his right hand, but as a royal personage, he or she also receives a musical instrument, a bell in the left hand. The musical instrument signifies that we're not only concerned with our own compassion, our own crown, our own cleanliness, but we have something to say. Rather than playing with our, by ourselves with all our toys, we have something to proclaim. The bell or ganta in Sanskrit is a karma family symbol, and this Abhisheka is connected with karma family. Karma is the fulfillment of action. Here it is the utterance of sound, which cannot be blocked, sound which can be heard by anybody, anywhere. If we are around the corner, we can hear it. If we are far away, we can hear it. If we are close by, we can hear it. The karma sound of the bell is unobstructed. We cannot hide underneath our chair, pretending we did not hear anything. The bell is heard and understood completely and thoroughly. It pierces our ears. The sound of the, of the bell is also very high pitched, which invokes wakefulness. We cannot fall asleep anymore because the sound of the bell is too penetrating to our ears. Actually, when we, when we hear this, when we hear a bell, it's sometimes it's, it's sharp to the degree that it's annoying, but that's actually intended. I personally sometimes have something with my teeth. I've actually put a little bit of tape around my own bell just because it tends to be a little bit too sort of shrill. But the intention of the bell is that it's something that wakes us up more than just being sort of a nice tinkling sound. So, then the fifth Abhisheka, Trungpa just says, also uses the Vajra and bell, but in this Abhisheka, the bell and the Vajra are fastened together at 
right angles with a silk ribbon. The king already has a clean body and a beautiful clothes. He has a crown, he holds a scepter as a sign of power, and he has a bell for proclaiming. So what is lacking? He does not have a name. We do not yet know which king we are. Who are we? That is a problem. If we do not know who we are, we have very little to say. We may try to say something, but we have no idea what our name is or what our status is, whether we're literate or illiterate, or even whether we, act we are actually a human being. The first thing we usually say to people is, how do you do? Which is like ringing the bell. Then we introduce ourselves. My name is Jack Parsons, Julie Smith, or whatever. Similar, similarly, in this Abhishek, we introduce ourselves to this to the world. So this Abhishek is called the Abhishek of name. In this Abhishek, our Vajra master rings the bell with the Vajra attached to it above our heads. And at the same time as the bell is rung, we're given a tantric name, which is traditionally known as our secret name. So this is where those who have received tantric initiations, they will actually have little pieces of paper where then their particular uh, name is written down. And it's said that this name then is called out in, in the, when we pass away, our, our master will call us by the, this particular name. So it's quite important that we remember this name and also that we, we can't remember that we sort of look after this piece of paper. This name is not publicized as our ordinary name, but when we need to use our power or to wake someone up, we say our Vajra name, our Tantric name. The name Abhishek is connected with the Buddha family. It is the sense of complete spaciousness and openness that comes when we finally thoroughly take our place in the Vajra Mandala. So, Trumbaram just says, these five Abhishekas make up the Abhisheka form which is the first of the four levels of transmission that traditionally make up the complete ceremony of empowerment and in Anuttara Yoga. When we receive the Abhisheka form, there is a sense of enormous psychological prog progress and psychological change, change. We have gone through a whole process of being accepted and acknowledged. We have our scepter, we can proclaim, and now we know our name as well. We actually become a ruler of some kind. So this is where us who come across the Tibetan Buddhist tradition might wonder why do the masters uh, so often give um, Vajrayana empowerment? And to some extent, this is cultural in that in Tibet, this was something that very much was intended to uh, lift persons in the way that we've just had it described here, to actually make, turn people from being, you could say subjects, so subject to their own confusion into rulers, rulers of their confusion, rulers of their world. And so with a deep appreciation for the nature of, of the Abhisheka, then there's this strong sense of there being something incredibly valuable taking place. And so in Tibet, the, the, um, the practice of Abhisheka was, was, um, was quite, um, was, was very much one of, um, this being something that, that, that lamas would offer to students and to a large extent as a blessing, wishing persons to actually uh, gain this kind of authority in their lives. So Abhisheka was given quite widely. And yet, even though our, you could say, modern world, there's not the, this, you could say, the proper understanding of what Abhisheka is, it still comes with a very special atmosphere. And so certainly from the part of you of the ones that are bestowing this empowerment, um, there's a lot of insight into how this potentially can benefit whoever comes into contact with it. So we have someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which will give the Kala Chakra empowerment to scores and scores of people intending to really benefit. And also we say that when this kind of empowerment is given, this has a lot of, a lot of value. This has a lot of power to alleviate the troubles of the world. So, Thumpa Ramaji continues, a problem with many religious traditions is that they make a point of condemning us. They talk about how wicked we are and how terrible we are and how we have to pull ourselves together. And if we do so, they promise us some 
can be a reward. But the Vajrayana is an entirely different approach. The Tantric tradition builds us up so that we do not have to relate at the level of donkey reaching for a carrot anymore. The donkey has the carrot already, so the donkey feels good. We've been empowered, we've been acknowledged for our genuine worth, and in being acknowledged for our genuine worth, we're not ignoring the struggles that we have, but we're also seeing that we have innately a sanity that is not subject and submissive to the neurotic patterns. And that's where then we have this sense of rulership, authority. So that's where there's, we begin to, you could say, take the result as the path. Trumpet continues, the basic point of Abhisheka is not to zap us with magical power, but to bring us up slowly and gently so that we can experience and relate with ourselves simply. Because we exist and we have a body, therefore we can bathe ourselves. Having bathed, we can put our clothes on. Having dressed, we can put on our crown. Then we have something to hold in our hand and something to say. We can make a statement about why we are doing all this. And we have a name as well. This is the basic process of graduating from the ordinary world into the world of continuity, the tantric world. We finally become a real person. That is the basic meaning of Abhisheka. Trumpa Rinpoche continues, the ceremony of Abhisheka is actually based on the example of the Buddha. It said that Shakyamuni Buddha was once invited by King Indra Bhuti to teach the Dharma. The king said, I would like to relate with my sense perceptions and my emotions. Could you give me some teachings how I can work with them? The Buddha said, oh, you want to hear Tantra? And the king said, yes. The Buddha replied, if that is the case, let me excuse my arhats and my Hinayana and Mahayana disciples from the room. So he asked his disciples to leave. Then the Buddha appeared to the, to the king in royal costume and taught the first Tantra, the Guya Samaj. That was the first presentation of Tantra. So the Buddha is seen and then, so the Buddha is seen in different ways in different levels of practice. Unlike Hinayana and Mahayana, at the Vajrayana level, the Buddha is dressed as a king. He has a crown, he has a scepter in his hand, he has a royal gaze, and he behaves like a king. This is quite a different approach than the traditional Hinayana or Mahayana view. In fact, the, the Vajrayana approach could be quite shocking so pra to practitioners of the lower yanas. That is why the Buddha excused all his other disciples from the room before he introduced the tantric teachings. So, of course, in the modern context, it's possibly difficult to relate to uh, as if we take it literally. But we should understand what really is the message that's being given here. And the, the king who asked for this teaching is someone who um, in no way uh, is looking for a shortcut. He's, we would say that King Indra Bhuti was somebody who already for countless lives had actually progressed on the spiritual path and was somebody who had a basic, you could say, establishment in terms of understanding his own Buddha nature and already had a, a Mahayana disposition of caring. And as such, he didn't see any reason to renounce his, his uh, situation as a ruler and simply um, wishing to relate to his phenomenal world, his perceptions, his emotions, and so on, on the secret level, uh, there was no reason for him to change his outer exterior. And so also the Buddha, the Buddha recognizing the king's, you could say, qualities, uh, was not about telling the king, you know, you are like we were just talking about before, trying to make the king feel inferior or miserable and so on, and the Buddha consolidating his own superiority on, on the basis of making the king feel inferior, but rather the, the Buddha then um, empowers the king, just as you could say there's a peer-to-peer -peer situation where the master essentially empowers the student as a master. So that's where this is a very different approach. So we shouldn't be too literal in terms of thinking that something weird was going on, people had to leave, something sus sus suspicious is going on, but rather simply that it's a question of um, 
the Buddha communicating in an entirely different way with King Indrabhuti. Trumpa then continues, Abhishek, our empowerment, plays an extremely important part, part in tantric literature, tantric ceremony, and the tantric tradition altogether. One of the reasons that Tantra is so rich is because it actually relates with human experience as a physical situation rather than a lofty idea. In the Hinayana, we're struggling to maintain our awareness. In the Mahayana, we're trying to be kind to our neighbors. Vajrayana respects those disciplines, but it also transcends them and becomes the greatest idea of all. Vajrayana deals much more directly with ego than the previous two yanas. In the Abhisheka of form, we actually bathe ego, coronate ego, and give ego a scepter. Finally, when ego finds itself with everything it wants, it begins to flop. It begins to be so embarrassed that it becomes non-existent. Then we can begin to build a new kingdom of egolessness. That is the tantric way. So we could say that all of the glory that we are being, we could say, installed with or anointed with, all this glory ultimately is too much for the ego. So there's nothing in the, in the tantric discipline of, you could say, endorsing the senses and endorsing sensuality and so forth that actually, that actually conforms with the ultimate wishes of ego because ultimately ego wants to remain hidden and fester in the dark. But here we're taking the whole situation out in the light and we're giving everything that, that ego possibly might sort of, uh, you could say, aspire to is given, but it's within the light and within this sort of complete endorsement, wholehearted endorsement of the sort of the ultimate value of who we are, that the actual pettiness of ego is, is such that it can't stand that. And so the last thing the ego wants to do is actually be dignified. The ego doesn't want to be to, to sort of um, possess all these accoutrements of, of, um, of being regal. The ego would like to claim that we we want to have all these things, but the thing is actually ego doesn't want it. And so by being given the, all the accoutrements of royalty and being empowered as a deity, it's actually the last thing that ego practically wants. And so that's where the, the skill of the Vajrayana actually lies in this empowerment that ultimately becomes the empowerment of egolessness. It actually becomes an introduction to the Vipassana, the experience of emptiness, the emptiness of our ordinary projections, and the empowerment of that which is beyond ego, which is entirely egoless, which is then Buddha nature. So that's where being empowered as as a deity is being is empowering the Buddha nature, which is entirely free from any any stain of of um, ego, any stain of confusion. Trumbhamja then says, "Sometimes I wonder who thought of tantra. It constantly amazes me, but it happened. It exists. Somebody actually thought up such an idea and transmitted it to to people." And it actually works. It is very amazing. I suppose we could call it magic. Okay, I think we'll stop here today and then see if there's any questions. Um, each Abhishek is related with the Buddha family. Why this? Uh, well, we actually explained how the first Abhisheka um, is related to the five Buddha families. So if you look at the text, then it actually describes how the, the five families are actually reflected in these five empowerments. Uh, I don't get that ego wouldn't want that kind of royal recognition. Well, ego would, you could say, claim to have um, this sort of regality. And it would like to be, you could have all the luxury of, of um, royal status, but it actually wouldn't want to have the nobility of the regal uh, status. Um, ego actually doesn't want to walk straight. Ego would, would like to slouch. Ego wouldn't want to sit straight. Ego wouldn't want to walk with 
with with with grace and so that's where the the um the the logic here is that we actually we um we give ego this whole dose of everything that ego thinks that it wants but it actually backfires in terms of ego's own agenda so being given all this all this um this status uh is taking is taking the the uh, the 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 agenda of ego out in the open the thing is ego actually works beautifully when it's when it's suffering ego would say i i'm so suffering because i don't have sanity i so suffer because i don't have you know all the things that i want and so that's where the whole drama can perpetuate but in case it's given all of this then there's no drama left and that's the last thing that the ego would want is being left without a drama Um, who then thought up Tantra? Uh, is it not Buddha? How am I supposed to think? Oh, that's this is just Tumbra, which is sort of playing around. And of course, you could say the nature of Tantra is universal to enlightenment. So it was taught by the Buddha. It's been taught by everyone since the Buddha. So, um, so it's not. And the thing about Tantra, actually, it wasn't thought up. This is just Tumbra, which you could say highlighting and highlighting the brilliance of Tantra and also using the sort of the language of us in the modern world you know we go around saying wow this is so far out who could have thought of that you know but of course it lies beyond anything that is thought of and it's the very nature of um, the very nature of enlightenment so it is something that is would always be taught by the buddha it's implicit in all the buddha's teachings and we would say the explicit the explicit teaching of tantras uh, occurs, but not at all, at the time of all Buddhas. It's not all Buddhas that actually teach Tantra. Really depends on the on the merit um, and the, of the students and the situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the question of the five families has been answered. Okay. Okay, no more questions. Usually there's a lot of questions here. You guys are getting rusty. I think after the break, then people have been, yes, there's a, there's a question. As a noble this would also encapsulate um, discipline um, where the ego doesn't want to hold that moment of discipline. Yes, yes, so there's a question here. So again, coming back to ego being dressed up in royalty, ego, um ego doesn't want the discipline that comes with the regality whereas yes regality comes with a lot of discipline actually if anybody's watched this netflix series called the, Cr the crown this actually exposes really you could say the nature of abhisheka because here you have um a woman who is in who has been enthroned as the queen of england and she embodies this through her discipline but there's no doubt, and the series of constantly comes back to this, you could say, tension between her being an ordinary human being and yet inhabiting the, the role of being the queen. And her, dis, her, her success as a ruler, and this everybody, and at that point she's, now she's into her 90s, right? Everybody has to actually say, hey, she's actually done a very good job because of the discipline. So she might be an ordinary person, but actually living this discipline of being uh, the crown the queen um actually she has accomplished what she set out to do so of course there would have been all sorts of ups and downs and so forth but in the process she continually comes back to actually this discipline of upholding this this you could say samaya or this commitment to the her role as a as the ruler very interesting actually for for vajrayana practitioners this is actually a really <laughs> it's a very helpful series you know if you're going to waste your time watching series like that then this is a, a good one um is attending abhisheka without really understanding what's going on is there benefit yes we that's exactly why we would have in uh in, in tibet uh, abhisheka is given as a blessing so many of the students wouldn't understand what was going on, but there would be an appreciation that is something very sacred. And even in the modern world, where there might not be any understanding whatsoever, it's still given 
with the, you could say, the power that lies in the good intention of the one who is bestowing it. So by that power, of the, by the, the power of the compassion of the one bestowing it, there's a lot of benefit. And of course, even more if there is a respect for that. And of course, then ultimately, tremendous benefit if there's a complete understanding of what's going on. Is there a time when the student doesn't need any more empowerments? Or do we keep receiving them for the blessing even if we received before? Well, you know, like um, my teacher Dingo Chandra he would still receive empowerments and very much, of course, to uphold the lineages. But also there would be this, um, this sense that, that, that there is continually something to be gained from receiving empowerment. So, um, so maybe at the 10th Bhumi, then we, we don't need empowerment anymore, but until then it's quite helpful. Um, in the Guru Yoga of the Nundra, we go through five, four Abhishekas, yeah, five Abhishekas, four, four Abhishekas, yeah. And that's where in, in the case of the Nundra, then the five Abhishekas we've described here are really just condensed within the first Abhisheka. Um, <laughs> uh, it has some significance. It has some significance. Yeah, somebody is asking about something. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? The next part gets very interesting. Pumpermit is going next time. Okay, I'm giving you a little sort of what do you call it trailer. Uh, next time, Pumpermit is going to be actually in quite some detail talking about his upbringing. Uh, very different from the kind of pedagogy that we operate with in the modern world. Uh, so this will be quite interesting. Um, he's going to talk about his his training in Tibet. So. Um, so watch this space. Yeah. Then a couple of last questions. In how the Buddha presents himself sometimes unconventionally, is this skillful means? Uh, I've been following DJKR on social media and it's quite different to other lamas. Oh yeah, yeah. And the thing is also, one thing we need to remember, the Nirmanakaya Buddhas and you can say all the various ways that the Buddha manifests compassionately, uh, is dependent on the students. So you could say the Buddha in some way uh, doesn't think I'm going to behave in this particular way, but the Buddha behaves by interacting with wake wakefulness, being awake and possessing wisdom, not, not being deluded, then naturally just interacting will be skillful. The Buddha's interaction with the world is just permeating by this non-dual sanity. And there, the, the Buddha cannot help but just simply be skillful in, in the dealings of the world. And so when we see different lamas, of course, Sansa Jamakin Rinpoche, he's one way, and you will also find uh, other lamas um, behaving in different ways. So, so when we have the enlightenment in act, interacting with the world, it will be inevitably be in different ways depending on the on the students. Uh, why is the fourth Abhisheka called word, meaning word empowerment? Because it's on the in the on in the fourth empowerment, there's actually just there's pointed to something that it lies beyond language. So the the means there is simply just some words. In the other empowerments, like here with the first empowerment, there's the bathing, the crown, and so forth. 
but with the last one which is the most subtle one the the skillful means is is then words the teacher will point to something which lies beyond words there will be a few words maybe the t teacher will show just a crystal or maybe a mirror but essentially it will just be on the basis of a sort of a, a some short pithy instructions that the the nature of the fourth empowerment um, is conferred okay I guess that's it for today and once again it's a privilege to be back here and doing this with you so um so thank you thank you for being here and i uh, hope to see you next next wednesday through this virtue may all beings throughout existence awaken together without a single being left behind in the pure realm of the luminous essence, the ground of the great perfection, may they remain inseparable from the kayas and wisdoms. Through all our births, wherever we may be born, may we be endowed with the seven good qualities of the higher realms. As soon as we are born, may we meet with the Dharma and have the freedom to practice it properly. At that time, may we please the holy gurus and practice the Dharma throughout the day and night. Realizing the Dharma and accomplishing its essential meaning, may we cross the ocean of existence in that life. Thoroughly teaching the Holy Dharma in this world, may we never tire of accomplishing the benefit of others. By this vast benefit of others, without partiality or bias, may all attain Buddhahood together. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>